This portrait was given to me by Lady Probyn Jones, who, as you know, of course, was uh, the daughter-in-law of Sir Robert, and, um, incidentally, his niece. Shows him in what I think is a very characteristic uh, mood. It was painted when he was about 53 years of age. It was a little time later that uh, I became a, a pupil of his in Liverpool. But you, I believe, um, came in contact with him when you were a child. Quite true. Owing to knee joint trouble, I was under Robert's care for a number of years. But I didn't see him again until the summer of 1913 during the meeting of the International Congress of Medicine in London. He was president of the orthopedic section of that mammoth congress. Mammoth in <laughs> terms of those days. Later in the year, I went up to Liverpool to see him at work at the Royal Southern Hospital. Saturday afternoon was his regular outpatient clinic day. Wednesday afternoon, his operating session. I remember one occasion for various reasons. That gallant young man Noel Chavez, who was later to get a VC. A double VC, in fact. Was his house surgeon. Yes, one of the two sons of the Bishop of Liverpool. I suppose that Saturday afternoon clinic was quite typical. Great numbers of patients coming through quickly, rapid examinations and accurate diagnoses, that extraordinary insight which Robert had, but above all, his beaming personality and the aura of hope which he radiated. I think you saw about 80 patients in, in two hours. Yes, I can picture that very well. Um, he was, interestingly enough, although doing orthopedic surgery, still appointed as a general surgeon. Yes, and he held that status until the day of his retirement. But he had an assistant surgeon, Theodore Armour, <laughs> who did the uh, general surgery which came to the unit, but Armour was also an orthopedic surgeon. Oh, and he succeeded, Sir Robert. He, he was, uh, he became entirely orthopedic in his interests. True. At the time you were there, uh, Sir Robert uh, was associated with two general surgeons whom I knew quite well, uh, Newbolt and Douglas Crawford. And they did the general surgery. Well, Robert was very busy, of course, at that time. But I don't think he reached the uh, height of his fame. Although, in 1913, the man who'd been selected to be president of the uh, orthopedic section of a, of a great international congress, obviously was then a world figure in orthopedic surgery. But he became still more internationally famous after the First World War. Nevertheless, in 1913, a man who had been selected to be president of the orthopedic section of that great international congress of medicine was already a world figure in orthopedic surgery. Because that was the last uh, congress uh, of the, that society ever to be held, because it was due to be held in Berlin in 1914, mm. and by that time, uh, Robert had gone into uniform. And uh, it wasn't long before he had gathered round him a team, a magnificent team of, of young men. Uh, he, 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 was, uh, he was their leader, and a great leader, wasn't he? True. And in doing this, he found great opposition. There were very few men available who could devote themselves to what we call military orthopedic surgery. He wanted a few young men whose background and training he could trust. Uh, his own pupils came first and foremost at Alderhay, Liverpool, a branch of the First Western General Hospital. There, he had Theodore Armour and T.P. McMurray, both men of experience. That was in 1915. Later, at Oxford, he placed uh, Gaddleston in the orthopaedic section of the Territorial General Hospital there. He extracted Orwin Smith from the Canadian forces in France. Orwin Smith had been his house surgeon and private assistant once and already had earned a DSO in the field. He placed Alwyn Smith in charge of the unit at Cardiff. Well, where did Norton Dunn come into the picture? Norton Dunn, I think, had gone east as a battalion medical officer. But on the way home, invalided, he was in hospital in one of the Greek islands. And there he met Walter Rowley Bristow, also uh, <coughs> invalided out after the evacuation of Gallipoli. On arrival in England, Dunn was recruited by Sir Robert 
uh, and sent to Birmingham, charge of the unit there. And Bristow was put on the staff at Shepherd's Bush. Now, Shepherd's Bush ultimately became the largest military orthopedic centre, although Alder Hay remained the pioneer unit. At Shepherd's Bush, in the original team, there was Aitken, once Robert's house surgeon, and then his private assistant in his London practice, and Reginald Elmsley of Bards, mm -hmm. who was in no sense a product of the Liverpool School. And then later, W.H. Trithowan of Guys. <laughs> what a character Trithowan was, wasn't he? I remember uh, his sitting next to me at a BOA dinner, and he said that uh, you could write the whole of orthopedic surgery on the, uh, on the back of the menu card. And then, spluttering a little, he said, no, you could write it, on half the menu card, and then he said, damn it, you could write it on a postage stamp. Function. That's orthopaedic surgery. You remind me, Brian, one of those exciting occasions when Trithorne was demonstrating clinical cases uh, at the Royal National Orthopaedic Hospital in London during meeting of the British Orthopaedic Association. He was talking about uh, relapsed club foot. You may remember he was an exponent of the open operation. <laughs> He considered that the use of the Thomas wrench was a barbarous attack on the human foot. <laughs> he said that it tore up the ligaments by the roots instead of dividing them in a clean fashion. There sat Sir Robert, adjusting his pince nez and beaming and smiling. <laughs> I have met a great many famous men in my long professional life, but never a more tolerant man. Well, I can remember another story about uh, Trithan. He was uh, protesting vehemently against the lengthening of the uh, tender Achilles in a good-looking young woman. Uh, he said that if you lengthen the tendon because the calf was, muscles were short, then the calf went higher. And she might be walking along the road, and behind her a young man wondering why on earth one calf was higher than the other. <laughs> uh, Trothan was a, a, a master of the open correction. Oh. He had such beautiful hands. However, we're wandering from the theme of, of the Robert Jones uh, and the First World War. We've talked about uh, Aitken, Gerdeston, Elmsley and Trothan. There was myself uh, in Manchester. Robert placed me in charge of what was quite a small unit. And we mustn't forget Scotland, where at Bangor, on the outskirts of Edinburgh, there was Sir Harold Stiles running a unit with the assistance of Maud Forrester Brown, who did such excellent work on peripheral nerve injuries. There was a small unit, I remember, in Aberdeen. And then came the American reinforcements, of orthopaedic surgeons of considerable standing for the United States who were distributed to various centres, Liverpool, Birmingham, Leeds, Edinburgh and so on. In Birmingham there was Frank Dixon of Kansas City and in Edinburgh Baldwin who during his stay introduced an operation involving resection of a piece of the ulna in cases of fusion of the inferior radio on the joint to restore rotation. Mm. And then, of course, there was Robert Osgood in charge of the whole contingent, who became <coughs> Robert Jones' chief administrative staff officer. Yes, one of the most extraordinary things about uh, Robert, and I should think one that had as much influence on British and on world orthopaedic surgery as anything else, was his, his inherent capacity for attracting men of ability. Not only did he detect them, pick them out as it were, but he attracted them. And they were pleased to be around him and to be with him, to watch him and listen to him. And his first disciples built British orthopaedic surgery. After the war, uh, I remember there was quite a substantial Irish contingent and Baldy Horton uh, used to sing at the dinners, very sweetly indeed. I remember Horton quite well. He was an old-fashioned orthopaedic surgeon on the staff of that little orthopaedic hospital in Dublin. Also a general surgeon at Stevens Hospital. William de Courcy Wheeler became an attaché of Sir Robert's. 
all sorts of conditions of men wanted to come within his orbit. Merkiansen of Leiden, one of his most devoted friends, once described Robert as the sun man, a man who radiated joy and light. And the great putty of Bologna regarded Robert as a master. Went to America in with him. I went you? to America in 1921 on the same boat as Sir Robert to attend the American Orthopedic Association. And I remember the reception he received and the awe with which he was regarded by the American orthopedic surgeons. He was indeed a world figure. I learnt that the most lovable characteristics of this great man were his humility, his sincerity and his simplicity. Yes, Above all, uh, 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 sincerity. But he had a, a pleasant, impish wit. Mm -hmm. And I remember, and I think you'll remember as well, a meeting the BRA in, uh, I think, the Royal Society of Medicine in Wimpole Street, with a great deal of traffic outside, and uh, a r rather boring paper being read in a dull, monotonous way on a dull, boring subject. At least the reader made it seem so. And uh, to make matters worse, Every time that uh, anything passed in the street outside, he stopped. Well, Robert saw that we were getting all very fidgety and on edge, and finally, when the tension was becoming unbearable, uh, Robert uh, tapped uh, the reader on the, the arm, and with a most disarming and apparently innocent smile, said, Shall I stop the traffic? Uh, well, it's 32 years ago, but uh, it's in my mind's eye as clear as can be. Well, that brings up another memory, and I'm afraid this is rather a sad one. Robert came over to Manchester to broadcast in the BBC studio for the appeal for the Royal Southern Hospital, Liverpool. I think it was the hospital centenary. They tried to get him to broadcast in Liverpool, but in those days, there were very few studios. And so he had to come over, and he stayed the night with us. And I went down to the studio with him and insisted on going in. At first they wanted to turn me out in case I made a noise or rustle some papers. But I stood quite quietly uh, during his broadcast. And I remember that his voice came over rather as the voice of a sick man. He was then, of course, beginning to fail. I took him back to our house. He wouldn't eat very much. And my wife thought he went early to bed. The next morning, we took him to the station and put him on the train for Liverpool. That was in 1932, because he died in January 1933. And he was uh, never really professor of, of uh, orthopedic surgery? No, no. No, at the height of his uh, post-war activities. He was really, uh, I think, beyond the, um, the statutory age for a professor. And, um, but he did become the um, director of orthopedic studies, they made him that, uh, and they created in his honour a degree in orthopedic surgery. And they also made a memorial lectureship in the University of Liverpool. Mm. But because uh, he was still alive, uh, the, the, they, they called the lectureship the Lady Jones Lectureship. And one of my earliest recollections when I did orthopedics, I wasn't qualified very long, was of uh, Putty delivering the Lady Jones lecture. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, it was on a subject which he called neurodoshitis, <laughs> which today is called uh, disc lesion. Uh, did Robert do much uh, formal uh, teaching in, in the uh, postgraduate course? Well, not a great deal. I remember very well his lecturing to us as postgraduates, but he was best in a series of clinical reminiscences, each of which made some point of importance. I, I remember also that he was perfectly delightful uh, as an examiner in the mastership degree. Uh, this, uh, I'm told you, had been created in his honour, 
Uh, and um, although there was a board of orthopaedic studies for some time, there wasn't much of a course for years until all of a sudden, in 1923, an Australian applied to join the course. So they had to make one. The name of the Australian was Vance, mm. and uh, he gained his degree in 1924. The Board of Orthopaedic Studies at that time included Sir Robert Kelly, uh, Theodore Armour, Thurston Holland, T.P. McMurray, and of course Sir Robert himself. The uh, last three were internal examiners for the degree. The first external examiner was uh, Thomas Fairbank. And it's not without interest that until this, that this spring, during this spring, uh, of the people who took part in that first examination, including the candidate, all were dead except Sir Thomas Fairbanks. And as you know, he, he died only very recently. And from such a beginning, 36 years ago, this school, in the charge of T.P. McMurray, and now under yourself, has taught orthopaedic surgeons coming from and practicing in countries far overseas. How many uh, masters of orthopaedic surgery are there? About 225. Well, that is a remarkable achievement. And thus, today, in Great Britain, the United States, throughout the world, the spirit of Robert Jones lives on. It is a great heritage. And we are the men who follow in the path of the great master. Because Robert Jones worked and lived, there are now in Great Britain increasing opportunities for young orthopaedic surgeons to devote a considerable part of their time to teaching and research in university departments, in royal colleges, and in the great special orthopaedic hospitals. If Robert Jones could see the picture of orthopaedics as you and I see it today, Brian, and perhaps he's looking down upon us, he would indeed have rejoiced. Harry, that is a just and lovely tribute. And now just to end with, uh, I think you'd enjoy a recollection I have of Robert uh, in the first uh, series of um, uh, mastership examinations. A patient of mine, uh, a child with pseudohypertrophic muscular paralysis, a very suitable case, a test case for the clinical part of the examination, uh, was wanted, but his mother had been very reluctant to bring him. And I persuaded her by explaining that uh, not only would she be have a child examined by a great specialist from London, but by Sir Robert Jones himself. Well, I told Robert of this, and of course, he immediately agreed to have a word with her. And uh, I, I can see him in my mind's eye now, beaming and, as you say, radiating sunshine. I, I see him talking to the mother about this relatively hopeless case and saying, well now, mother, is he getting any worse? And she replied, well, no, he isn't any worse. And he said, I always find in these cases that if they don't get any worse, it is very satisfactory. Whether she believed him or not, I don't know. But she went away a happy woman, grateful for having been allowed to see this great man. Mm -hmm.